1998, a series of chance finds scattered across this field near Manchester inspired a local enthusiast to start field walking. And for eight years, he's been walking and walking and walking. Now, after hundreds of hours of close scrutiny, he's accumulated evidence of over 8,000 years of human activity, from the prehistoric to the post-medieval. But it's the Romans who seem to have been particularly active. There's loads of metalwork, including coins, brooches, and this gorgeous little snake bracelet. But the site itself remains an archaeological mystery. So what was going on here? Local archaeologists believe they've discovered a fortlet, but then not all the finds are military and they cover over 250 years of the Roman occupation. So what were the Romans doing here in Warburton? We've got just three days to find out. Warburton's located near Manchester between the River Bolin and the Mersey. The village can be traced back to the Anglo-Saxon period and its parish church is dedicated to St Werburgh, the Anglo-Saxon saint from which Warburton takes its name. But over the past eight years, the locals have been finding evidence which has pushed back Warburton's origins much further. That's a pretty impressive array you've got there, James. It is, isn't it? We've got stonework here from the prehistoric with the flint work. We've even got Bronze Age, a small axe there, which is really nice. Is. But what's really excited me on this side is all the Roman material, the brooches and some of the coins and the various little bits and bobs. What do you think it all means, Mike? We've got quite a lot of material here from the Roman period, which is distinctively military. The, the, the brooches in particular and these nice little rings. But we don't get, usually, in the northwest this kind of concentration. If we're looking at military, I think we could be looking at something like a fort or a fortlet. It does seem to me to be a bit of a leap of the imagination, from a few finds to an imperial fort with loads of soldiers hacking away at the poor Brits. But we do have a bit more evidence. The, the local archaeology society have put in one or two trenches already in the field, and they've got what might be an enclosure, and in one of those trenches there's a ditch, a, a Punic-style ditch. What's a Punic ditch? It's a trap, a Roman military trap. Francis, could this site be a trap for the enemy? Well, I think we've got to be a bit, you know, a bit sceptical, because I've seen steep-sided ditches on farms, and to my eye, that metalwork doesn't look military. Um, I think it could be a farm. I think we've got to be very, very careful. You know, rectangular enclosure doesn't mean fort there. Um, so I think what we'll do first of all is uh, another metal detect. Let's do a detailed field walk, um, geofizz, and put a trench in put a trench alongside the earlier trench just to prove that that Punic ditch is a Punic ditch, and I might be convinced. <laughs> That's great. It's going to be a little <laughs> battle, isn't it, on day one? <laughs> There's no, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> history Hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans. Learn more about the wonderful and mysterious world of the ancients with History Hit. Follow us as we take you around some world-famous sites, including Pompeii and the stunning temple complex at Karnak. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Odyssey fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ODYSSEY at checkout. So battle commences as Stuart charges off on his trusty bike to survey the landscape and Henry begins to plot out a grid, preparing for the advance of an army of field walkers. Morning, thanks everybody for coming. We're going to try to field walk in 10 metre squares. In terms of artefacts, we're picking up everything from the earliest things to the latest things, including um, soft little bits of red clay, which should be what remains of the Roman pottery. Helen's troop of field walkers from the local archaeology group begin to scour the field. We're hoping that any concentrations of finds will give us precise digging targets and help us diagnose whether we've got a Roman fortlet or not. While the field walking continues, Richard the farmer begins to clear the bean crop 
so we can geofizz and put in our first trench. We're hoping that geofizz will help us identify the full extent of the enclosure and any internal features. This should tell us whether we've got a fort or a farm. But digging's not going to be held up, since Francis has pinpointed his first target using the results of the previous investigation. OK, Mike, so those two pegs down there, they mark your old trench? Yep, 2002 trench. 2002. And I am right, that was where you got the, whatever, the Punic ditch. The Punic ditch. Yeah, yep. OK. So we don't want to put a hole on top of that, because we'd look stupid. That's going in that direction for eight metres, isn't yep. it? Well, if we go this way, one, two, three, four metres, and put one in dead parallel with it, we should... That should come down on it, Yeah, it? it should be well away from the old trench, and, and we should cut this ditch okay. in two. OK, now, you hang on to that. I'll okay. mark the ground. Give it a good shake. Where am I going? Going that way. Right, let's get the digger. So we're putting in our first trench next to the previous excavation so that we can look at the form of this ditch and decide whether it really is Punic. And this will tell us for definite whether the site's military. David, what was the difference between a Punic ditch and any other kind of ditch? It has a, a standard V-shaped inner slope, but the outer face is vertical or near vertical, which means that once you've got in there, it's extremely difficult to get out and you become a sitting duck to uh, the defenders to throw anything at you. Why were they called Punic ditches? Does that mean they came from Carthage, as in the Punic Wars? No, they didn't actually come from Carthage, but the point was that the Romans thought the Carthaginians were extremely treacherous, and these ditches were meant to be treacherous to anybody who attacked across them. As the field walkers continue to march across the field, we still can't be sure whether our Romans were soldiers or farmers. But the finds are coming in thick and fast, and we're hoping they'll give us a clue. Oh, have we got much? There is a lot of this um, stuff that looks like brick, isn't there? I wonder if any of that's going to turn out to be the good Roman pottery. It is. It's just bloody sand, isn't it? Yeah. Just sand, sand and more sand. <laughs> it's like digging at Bournemouth, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's... Well, it looks charcoal. like that is charcoal, that is burning of some sort. I know it's possible that could be worms taking it all down there, but it's a fair old way down, isn't it? Well, there appears to be enough sand to build several castles, but no sign of a Roman fortlet yet. If this really is a military site, what sort of thing might it be? Well, it could be a... A fort, or it could be a fortlet. What's a fortlet? It's like a little, little, little fort. It is like a little fort, but there'll be a difference in purpose between the two. A fort is basically a place where Roman troops are garrisoned and they have a permanent presence in their area. A fortlet might be much shorter lived and have a particular purpose related to, say, a road that it may be lying alongside. Mind you, that's assuming it is military, but suppose it was something different. Uh, well, it could be a farmstead. It could be rectangular, just like uh, a fort uh, would be. Uh, but inside, it'd be rather less organised. You'd probably have roundhouses, just like they were in the Iron Age and even the Bronze Age, so old-style roundhouses. At our trench, it looks as though the Romans are about to make an appearance. Mike, there's your ditch. That looks promising, doesn't it? So it does look as though that charcoal was coming out right the other the side, edge. right on the edge of it. I'll be happier when we've got it sectioned and I can see it. Sectioned? Is... Do, do you want to do that by machine or by no, hand? Uh, no. No, I want to do that by hand. Yeah, by hand. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, this is a good start. But are the field walking finds turning out to be equally promising? So what do you think of the treasures so far? An awful lot of very recent, comparatively. Yeah. Almost no medieval and almost no Roman. No, nothing we can for definitely say this is this is Roman. Yes. But, you know, they're still out there, still going for it. Optimism, I like that. Yeah, Francis, you put in a long jump fit. 
Well, look at this. Hey, have we got something? Yeah, look at that. <laughs> well, carefully, it took us all morning to find that. <laughs> oh, wow. Rarely on day one have I ever seen <laughs> such a cornucopia of finds. <laughs> So what is this, Francis? Uh, I'm told it's Romano-British, and it's probably Cheshire Plains ware or something like that. Are they being serious or are they one? They up? are, they are. So what shape would that pot have been, Francis? <laughs> um, well, in a large storage jar about that high up <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, what have we got here? Um, well, we're currently thinking this is the ditch of the fort. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't think Jeffers can help us much. No, I think I've taken a jump backwards. <laughs> well, fact. what's the problem for you, John? There's no magnetic contrast whatsoever. Sand it's on sand. It's sand on sand. Yeah. So I can't track its course. That's its theoretical course. I mean, it should turn and come back. I can't see it. I can't see it at all. Well, where do we go from here? OK, if we assume that is the Fortlet ditch, we know which side of the Fortlet it is, and we can make a pretty good guess by measuring at where the other three sides are. So that's what we're going to do. Suck it and see, measure it out, see if the ditch is there. What, put more trenches in? Yeah, yeah. yeah. OK, well, while you do that, i better... Oh, careful! ...fight these off to the British <laughs> Museum. <laughs> <laughs> Geophys can't help us. But well, we do know that Roman fortlets were square, although we don't know exactly how big this one would have been. Using the locals' excavation report, we think our first trench has located the eastern edge, and we should be able to find the western side by digging directly opposite it. So Bridge begins to open trench two on the same alignment as Phil's trench. Francis and Matt are putting in a third trench to locate the southern side and find out the exact dimensions of the fortlet. Uh, Ian, I don't think we want to sort of pretty about with this. We've got to find a ditch, so let's go as deep as that trench over there, so a little bit deeper than that, and just hammer it back till we find the thing. The site's progressing nicely, and it looks as though we'll be able to fill in a real gap in the understanding of the Roman northwest. There is actually quite a lot of activity going on here. There are quite a number of major centres which are either industrial or military centres. Um, there's the, the major legionary fortress at Chester, for instance, on the, on the D. And then moving across, we've got a, uh, a fort and then an industrial site at, at Northwich. Another one at Middlewich producing a lot of salt in the, during the Roman period. There's Wilderspool, which was a manufacturing centre, which is the nearest site to, to Warburton. Um, and then we've got, of course, the fortress at Manchester. We know the Mersey's a big trade network uh, in the prehistoric period, in the Roman period. And we've got copper mining over at Oldley Edge, just a few miles away. And there could be uh, a road network that, 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 that links that into the Chester, Manchester, York Road. And we could be part of, the, of, of that kind of localised industrial network. But just as the team seem to be making advances with the fortlet, Stuart begins to signal a retreat. I'm a little bit concerned about what's in Phil's trench at the moment. What do you mean? Well, I was looking at the field patterns on the map. Yeah. And there used to be a field hedge boundary go down through here. It's shown on the 19th century mapping. So I'll just measure out where it was. So I measured up from the hedge junction there yeah. to where the line of the hedge would be. Its direction is straight towards the wood corner down there. It goes right through the centre of Phil's trench. So are you saying that the ditch of the fort, which Phil's found, might just be a hedge line? Yeah, it's quite possible. And suddenly the rest of the site's beginning to frustrate the archaeologists. In Roman times, a Punic ditch may have thwarted enemy attackers, but right now it's the lack of any archaeology that's starting to challenge our own army of experts. It's all looking a bit glacial, Matt, isn't it? Yeah, all the sand and the gravel actually had me fooled for a bit. Yeah? Back there, I thought, oh, it could be a ditch, but... No. no. Hey, getting on here, Bridge? Well, I've made a long trench, but I can't find anything in it. No features? None. No finds? Nothing. If we're looking at a fortlet, it's very small. For little soldiers like me. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember, there should be an entrance through a fortlet, shouldn't there? And what about if this trench is right through the entrance? If this is the entrance, it's a flipping big entrance, isn't it? <laughs> End of day one, and the trenches we opened to find the Punic ditch have finally joined up to become one huge monster trench. 
But have we actually found any evidence of the Roman fortlet? There's your Punic ditch, Tony. It is a Punic ditch? No. Oh. <laughs> no, this side, it's a U-shaped ditch. I think it's something off a farm or hedge. I mean, it, it, uh, it's modern. Right? Which is what Stuart feared. Yeah, he's right. But we do have probably the longest trench we've had on Time Team in many a year. <laughs> and unlike all those other trenches, this one hasn't produced a single find or a single feature. Nothing. Oh, well, yes, we have. We've had those two little pottery finds. Oh, no, 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 give me a break. No, they came out of that ditch and, I mean, they could be flower pot. I'm not happy about them at all. They're too small. And yet, and yet, and yet, this is a real puzzle. There have been finds coming off this field from 8,000 years of human history, and yet we found absolutely nothing. Why not? Let's hope we find out tomorrow. We came to this field near Manchester yesterday because the beautiful artefacts that had been found on the surface led local archaeologists to believe there might be a small Roman fort here. Well, not only have we not found a small Roman fort, we haven't found a small Roman anything. No pottery, no metal finds, no roof tile, no brick, absolutely nothing, even though we've dug a trench the length of a Heathrow runway. But are we panicking? Absolutely not. When there's a problem, who are you going to call? Geophys. <laughs> Gonna do? Well, look, that was the area over the fort where we got absolutely nothing. We've extended the survey in this direction and look at this area of noise. So could this be the fort? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, look at this plot. I mean, that suggests sort of burning metal objects, maybe. So it's just possible that that's where they've been making metal work. So you're going to dig it? Yeah, to me, that's a good, strong target. So I'm going to go get the machine and put a trench over it. Let's hope our luck's starting to change. We're putting in our next trench over John's Geophys to see if there's any evidence of metalworking. Because if the Romans didn't have a military presence on the site, our three-day campaign has still got to explain why all the Roman material's been found here. We were first drawn to this site because James, the local enthusiast, had been finding metalwork all over the field, with two concentrations at the bottom of the slope. And Francis believes that this area should be our next target. So what you got lined up for me today, then, Francis? Well, I think the key thing is to put a trench through or close by those two concentrations of metalwork on the downslope of the hill. And, and also, that will give us a nice transect across the top of the, the ridge here. It'll also give us some indication of the thickening of the plough soil as we go down the slope. Well, if we're going to do that, why don't we pull the trench back over here? What, right back here? Yeah, right back to here and extend the one from yesterday to meet it, well, just in case there are any stray archaeological features. <laughs> that will be the longest trench in time team history. <laughs> We're going for the full half mile, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I'll get my man on the job. Okie okay, doke. So we're hoping that a trench over the two concentrations of previous finds might unearth evidence of Roman occupation and explain how the metalwork got into the field in the first place. We want to learn as much as we can about the finds, so we've called in an archaeometallurgist to see if we can replicate one of them. Well, it's a, it's a snake bracelet, or at least part of a snake bracelet, uh, of Roman date. I know it doesn't look like one because it's straight now, but it, it's obviously suffered quite a lot of damage during its life. Um, and the, the snake head at, at this end has been broken. I'm not sure that if I was going to have a bracelet made for me, I would want one in the shape of a snake. Well, that's because we tend to think of snakes as frightening and, and sinister things, don't we? But in the classical world, they didn't. Before Christianity came on the scene, snakes seemed to have been emblems of healing um, and of rebirth. You know, you see the snakes on, on chemist symbols going, going twining around a star. Yeah. How would it have been made? Well, it's quite simple. Because it's a snake and there's no extraneous limbs, it's very easy to model. We can use just some beeswax, just made green with some pigment, and literally just get it soft and roll it into a loosely figured snake shape and then very simply just start to model the head and just start to define the features on it. It doesn't take much work because it's so simple and then later when as it gets harder we can start to put the finer detail on so we can put scales on or little elements, eyes and uh, mouth or whatever. So it just takes a half an hour or so just to model out. We need this other edge of it to Ian. What outward or back well, that way. way, no. So Phil extends the trench which he opened to look for archaeology relating to the previous finds. It's another Polden Hill type brooch. Meanwhile, Helen's thoroughly examining them to see what they can tell us about the Roman activity in the field, because we've still got to explain how all the local finds got here. 
We're exploring every avenue, including the one that runs along the edge of the field. If we can't find any signs of occupation, then a routeway might account for them. When, when we thought there was a, a fortlet in this field, one of the issues we were thinking about was access. You know, what, what's the fortlet doing and, and how would you get to, the, to, to that particular Roman military site? So you'd need for that a trackway and, and the likeliest candidate is, is, is what we're standing on now. But do we know that we've got a trackway? It seems to me all that we've got is a path by the side of a hedge. <laughs> I've been looking at the geography of the landscape and the field patterns and so on, it's great. And what's quite revealing is this kind of long finger of the high ridge, that's where our site is. This is a high dry ground. We've got bog on this side, we've got a river plain on this side. It's like a ridge of high ground pointing out to where the River Mersey is, uh, potentially for a crossing to this high ground over here. So there is the possibility of an early routeway across here. So what do we do about it? Um, I think we'll put a trench through it, <laughs> and I think we'll try to link that trench into our own trench system so that we can put it in contact. What might a trench tell us? Well, it'll tell us the history of this trackway. Uh, I bet you penny to a quid there's going to be stuff underneath it. And it may go back to Roman times. I mean, let's hope it does. Middle of day two, and our trenches are getting longer and longer, but there's still no sign of any archaeology. It's a real mystery. And Bridge is keen to see if a more scientific approach can explain why. Oh, a chemistry set, Bridget. <laughs> what have you been doing with it? I've well, been doing some pH tests, because one of the things that's come up is why is there no pottery? And the little bits that are here, mm. of course, are in really bad condition. It's been suggested there's quite high acidity in the soils here. So I thought, well, why not test that out and confirm? And um, I've done three here and actually tested them on the three soils from where Phil dug that, that feature yesterday. And this one here is from soils that came from within the feature that Phil dug yesterday. Mm, yeah. The one in the middle is from the natural geology yeah. and the one here on the right is from the Palau soil. Mm. And you can see that's much more yellow than these ones. Yeah. And this indicates that it's got an acidity of 6.5. Mm. The other two are neutral, they're 7 to 7.5. Mm. Well, 6.5 isn't very acidic, is it? I mean... Well, it won't really cause any harm to any pottery. So blaming the lack of finds on soil pH doesn't seem to pass the acid test. And as the search for any archaeology continues, even the dog has got involved. But Trench 4, which was open to explore the possibility of metalworking, has finally produced some results. Oh. Kerry, sounds like you've hit the metal. We have hit the metal, but it's not the metal we want. Why not? Well, um, we had a spread of something, yeah. and uh, I think we've got a spread of nails. Nails? Yeah. What kind of nails? Well, just iron, fairly modern nails, unfortunately. Like that? It's history. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you've been working on this site for ages. Why do you think that the only stuff that we're finding is modern stuff? Um, probably the farmer, you know, uh, burning, burning rubbish on the field, you know, getting rid of the rubbish. You're picking all your nails up, as you can, as you can hear now. It's, it's everywhere. But why aren't we finding anything older? <laughs> Probably because we've had it. <laughs> <laughs> that could be the answer. <laughs> well, it seems that we've quite literally nailed down John's metalworking site, but it's still not Roman. I'm not happy. You're not? No. We have done so many time teams in the past mm. where you get a field where the metal detectorists have been in, they've brought out a wealth of stuff and we've gone there all really excited. We find nothing because the metal detectorists have had it all and all we get is a couple of indiscriminate ditches. What worries me is the soil's very light, so every time it plows, and that's why it's so easy to metal detect, there's always new stuff being brought up, which implies that the features below are being eroded. So I, I'm actually very worried. While the trench over the fines concentration seems to be equally unrewarding, Matt and Naomi are busy working on the trackway to see if there's any evidence of a Roman road there. I'd give it another couple of scrapes. There's nothing in it. Stop there a second, Ian. I'm going to grab this. Ah, oh, a bit of tarmac. <laughs> Well, it's not the kind of surface we were hoping for, but there's still a chance there might be a Roman road beneath it. As 
The site continues to frustrate the archaeologists. Andrew's snake bracelet is shaping up nicely. So what actually happens to this beeswax model? Essentially, it gets burnt away. So what I have to do before that is to ply the whole surface with fine um, clay, fine clay and sand. That captures the whole thing. That makes the mould. And then we put it, heat to it, and that drains out the wax. Shall we? OK. It's a lovely fine mixture. You just knead it on with your hands. And you keep putting more and more of that clay on until yeah. it, it looks like this. Until it looks like that. And every layer has to dry perfectly until you get something that's like a brick. At the trackway trench, finally, we might have our first hint of something archaeological. Looks like you've got a result there, Matt. Yeah, we started the trench up th this end behind me, and we went yeah. straight down onto this yellow sand. And then we got to here, and immediately, very distinctly, dropped down, and we got this kind of orangey sand here. But it's a bit confusing because it, it, it seems like a cut almost, because it goes straight down and then across. I'm pretty sure what you've got there is a, is a plough headland. Right. Um, and this darker material here has fallen off the plough. In fact, if you look along the trackway, you can see there is a very slight rise just at the end of the beams. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, which yeah. the modern trackway is using. So, what would have happened that a plough would have come across here, turned, I mean, as it turns, the soil that had stuck to it falls off and forms this low bank. Obviously, it takes a long time to do. And then it goes back in that direction. Now, Stuart reckons that this field was first ploughed in the earlier 18th century, something like that. So you've got, what, two, three hundred years for the yeah. soil to accumulate. But what's important is that the, we now know that the ploughs were working in that direction, right. OK? And that would explain why the finds are going down the hill. Or getting dragged across. Getting dragged across. And the other thing is that there is no sign below the plough headland here of a Roman road or trackway. Yeah, so, nothing at all underneath it. If, had there been one, it would have been buried under the headland. So this is the best place to look for it, and I just simply can't see it. No. Two days on, and our enormous trench has so far produced nothing. The metalworking trench empty. The trackway trench zero. It seems completely mystifying. The locals dug in the same area and found a fortlit ditch. But Phil thinks he can explain what they were looking at, and it's not Roman. In fact, it goes right back to the Ice Age. And I think that the best candidate for the old ditch is that one. Mm. And now that we've seen the local geology, I mean, I think it's, it's pretty clear that the geology here is, is just gravel. It's coming out of the glacier. And I think as the glacier has moved back across the country, all these stones have been washed out. Where, 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 where we've got sand, you can see very, very fine lenses, which is very, very typical of sand that's laid down by water. This stuff here, I think, is part of the water laying gravel. You can see it's got a lot of the holes in where the sand has been washed out, and all you're left with is the stones. But I think what's happened is that the whole lot of gravel has been churned around at the end of the Ice Age, and what you get when that whole, all the earth is just churned up are things like this. You see how that stone is vertical, mm. not horizontal. If that was water lane, it would, it would fall flat. But once it gets mixed around in the ice, cracks appear in the Earth's surface and stones just drop down. Mm. And, of course, once you know these things and you can identify them, then you can interpret them. Natural geology can create wonderful, wonderful, I don't know, fake features. <laughs> <laughs> it's just unfortunate when they look like fortlets, isn't it? So the Punic ditches which the locals thought they identified are probably glacial deposits. End of day two, and the troops return to base, in archaeology speak, the pub, for an emergency strategy meeting. Are we sharing three days of great significance? Is this the first time in 14 years that we'll have made a time team in which we find absolutely nothing at all? It's got to be some sort of a record, I must confess. I mean, here we are, end of day two, we've put in 350 square metres and 
absolutely nothing. There can't be many fields in England where we would find so awesomely little. We've looked at these things as if we were 20 years ago. And so we're trying to chase individual finds with features buried below the ground. You can't link finds automatically with features. The archaeological world is changing. What metal detectors are revealing is that the ordinary, open, empty spaces of the ancient world were actually packed with finds. So what would have been a really rich field 20 years ago, today, actually, is sort of background noise. So what I want to do, I've heard at lunchtime today that the farmer next door, on the, also on that ridge, is going to be ploughing. And that's had very limited investigation. And what I want to do is to give it the full time team treatment. Survey it, shovel test pit it. Or basically, you take a few shovelfuls of soil, you sieve them, and that characterises a whole 20 metres square. Oh, I could do that, couldn't I? That would be a record too, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> then what? <laughs> we'll then metal detect it. And, uh, you know, having done all of that, I hope we'll have done a proper job. So are you in the process of spending an entire hour watching us find not one single thing, or is this going to be a classic time team where on day three we suddenly come up trumps? <laughs> we'll find out tomorrow. Although in a rather perverse sort of way, I'd be disappointed now if we found anything. <laughs> beginning of day three and we came to this field near Manchester two days ago in order to try and find the source of some fantastic Roman artefacts that had appeared on the surface and as you can see we did a pretty good job of searching except that we've found absolutely nothing so today final throw of the dice we're going to move over to that field over there and we're going to take our metal detectorists and our archaeologists and quite frankly they're going to need all the help they can get <laughs> Having dug this field to death, we're moving into pastures new and the next field along. And we're throwing everything at it. Archaeologists, field walkers, metal detectorists, even the dog. We think the new field is a good target since it's virgin territory. And more importantly, it also lies on the ridge of high ground, which Stuart believes is the most likely candidate for Roman activity. I feel as though I'm surrounded by low-key chaos. Yes, that's because we're desperately trying to find out as much as we can about the whole field in a very short time. So we are doing a number of things. First of all, we're starting off with the old standby, which is geophysics. Yeah. But we're not really expecting it to produce anything because the results have been frankly terrible. And then we are metal detecting all the way across the field and labelling, tagging all our signals, which Henry's then plotting in with the GPS. It means that we're using metal detecting in the same way that we would normally use geophys in order to create a pattern on the ground, which we can then use as evidence about where we should put a trench in. Yes, and then the third thing that we're doing with it is, because it was only ploughed this morning, we decided to go for the technique of shovel pitting, where we dig a, a small hole right in the middle of, a, of each 20 metre square across the field, and that recovers a certain amount of artefacts so that you can characterise what's going on in the, in the topsoil from those artefacts, which we can then use in conjunction with the geophysics, if it produces anything, to locate a trench. Time's of the essence, since we've only got one day to explore the whole field. So everyone gets busy. Everyone, that is, except Phil, who's refusing to be dragged away from yesterday's trench. And Helen's still got loads of James's finds to double-check. It's quite worn on that edge. So that's fixed yeah. into the wood of the, of the <clears throat> cart somehow, is it, in the, the I rings? I think it is. I mean, it's some way of distributing straps around, yeah. around the cart. Mm. Um, so a rain travels through that? Yes, yeah. yes. First century. Yeah, I mean, the rain would have run through there because you've obviously got quite a lot of wear yeah. on this edge here. It's gone quite thin. OK. And at our original field, Phil's tenacity has paid off. And, yes, he's got a result from his trench. I've never been quite sure why we've explored quite this far out in the field. Well, if you remember, there was metal work that was coming off the crest. There were two concentrations, and Phil's trench was to come down the hill and, and, and follow that metal work. Well, actually... It's been much better than that. We've found two lynchets. What's a lynchet? <laughs> well, it literally is it's an old field system. What you've got to imagine here, Tony, is literally a, a stairway 
of, of fields running parallel to the slope. And what is happening is that uh, plough soil, as you plough along the slope, soil moves down the slope. And where France's is, you will have a bank. And down here, you've got a cutaway terrace. You can see here that you've got uh, a dark brown topsoil, that's this stuff, and it comes straight on to natural. Now, as we come down the slope, we've got three layers. We've got the dark topsoil, but in the middle, we've got this brown material, which is sloping down here, and at the bottom, we've got the natural. And this brown material is where the plough has actually sliced into the natural and moved all the soil down that way. So you'll have a bank here, and here there's a big cutaway. And so you've got a whole series of stairways. And you can see that the next cutaway terrace is up there where the chap is there. So you've got these, these fields that are about, what, 20, 30 metres wide going down the hill. Do we have a date for these lynchets? Well, we, we, we've got scrappy pottery from the, from the bottom of this lynchet that runs through the Roman 16th century and 18th and 19th century. So we might have 2,000 years of agriculture ploughing on this site. But it, the important thing is that is exactly when the metal finds were being made. That is exactly the date of all those metal objects. What's exactly the period? The medieval or the Roman? Roman into medieval period. So what you're telling me is the thing that you're excited about is the fact that we now have a field which we knew anyway. We know it's going down a slope, we which we know. knew anyway. We didn't know. And it's got finds in it which are either Roman or medieval. We didn't know that This there... is what you're excited... Are you <laughs> mad? No, no. no, there's more we to bet. it, Tony. The thing about lynchets is they're only formed by ploughing, OK? And that explains how the finds got into the topsoil in the first place. They were put there in manure. And the manure came from the farm or the settlement, which could have been over there, it could have been over there, I don't know. This was a purely agricultural landscape, but we now under understand the mechanism by which it formed. And until we dug this trench down here, we had no indication that there was a pre-existing field system on this hill. Yeah. The only field system that we could see was the present field system. This shows that there was a completely different landscape here in the Roman and probably the medieval medieval period. Which is why it's not on the 18th century map, because the, these fields are totally different. So finally, we're beginning to reveal the history of this landscape. The lynchets are evidence of an earlier terraced field system, possibly Roman. And this would explain how the finds got into the soil, as rubbish mixed in with the manure which fed the crops. Well, Stuart, we're getting wildly overexcited about two lynchets out there. How do they fit into what we know about the landscape? I mean, if you go back to the medieval period, uh, what you've got is the, is the medieval village of Warburton here in red. You've got a, a, a church down here and a priory, arable ground here, meadow around the edge, and, and park and manor centre up here, and the peat and mosslands over here. But you've got a strip of open ground, all suggesting that this strip where our fields uh, located is the pasture for the animals of Warburton village and the parish. So that's the pasture on which you'd have had the animals that would have manured the arable. That's right. This yeah. is quite important in the understanding of this. Yeah. Also, the pattern of movement it actually is along that road that's there today, the road that we, we come along, leading from Dunham straight down to Warburton and then crossing over the river. The Mersey itself is an important boundary in the Saxon period between Mercia and Northumbria. And if there's Saxon occupation close to a major boundary, there's a very strong chance there might be even Roman occupation. So those, those lynchets that we found are likely to predate the medieval pasture, you reckon? Indeed, uh, yeah, I, I, mean, I would say that quite categorically from the evidence I can put together, yes. While we seem to be getting to grips with the site, the wax has melted out of the mould and the snake bracelet has reached the critical stage of its process. Oh, this is when I always get tense. <laughs> This is the bit where you come just at the perfect time because it's molten, but it's also when everything could go wrong. Yeah. So we've got the crucible down here in amongst all the charcoal. There's some heat hot. coming off that, isn't oh, it? Oh, it's so hot. Now I'm going to go for it. How long have you got? Oh, just seconds. Cool. Hey! Right, I wasn't expecting that to be so... So liquid? So liquid? Yeah. Well, well, some of it went over the side, but that's, that's fine. That's What's fine. the dangers of this? I don't mean dangers to you, I mean dangers of messing it up. 
Well, the dangers are, I mean, this is why this, this mold's been fired, and it's been fired very thoroughly, yeah. because the wax that was in there, if any of that's left in, that's going to turn to carbon, and that reacts with the silver. Yeah. The other thing is, which is even worse, if there's any moisture in there, that turns to steam and bubbles out the top, okay, and it's like yeah. Vesuvius, then you get silver everywhere, and you get shotgun splatter of silver pellets. How long do you reckon it'll take to cool off? I'm going to give it about five minutes, because I'm quite anxious to see it. <laughs> so. Lunchtime day three, and the new field is now speared with hundreds of canes marking all the metal detector responses. What are the red dots? The red dots are the non-ferrous. Combining this with the geophys and shovel pit results, we've plotted out any hot spots, and with only a few hours to go, the pressure's on to decide where to dig. There does seem to be a long line of finds there, doesn't there? Where's that in the field? That's sort of on, on the edge of that hill, you know, on, on the edge of that ridge. Ah. So Phil begins to dig a trench in the new field over the biggest response to see whether there are any finds and to analyse how they got into the ground. Is that in the spoil that's coming out or is that in the... Could it be really, really small or can't it? Oh, it is very small, yeah. It seems to be pretty localised, doesn't it? Is it in there, for example? No. Try that for what I've got me on. Nope. Try that. In there then. It's over in that corner somewhere. Yeah. Must be very, 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 very small, whatever it is. Lead. Well, I ain't damned. It's a lead seal. You know the seals that you put on the bags? That's what I think it is. It's quite a nice little pattern on there, yeah. isn't it? Our prize find. Who needs Roman when you've got a seal from a 19th century seed bag? The field's now littered with trenches and Helen takes a quick tour to see what's turning up. No features? No, oh, we're not in there. No. <laughs> Anything good? The last bit that came up, courtesy of the detector, was that. Oh, yeah. It was the last bit we came out. Yes. Looks, looks good on that side, doesn't it? Yeah. And uh, not much on the other side, probably half a button. Never mind. OK, thanks very much. You're welcome. This whole field is dotted with tiny, discreet test pits, and suddenly we've got Phil's zonking great hole. What's that all about? <laughs> what we're hoping to prove is, is that there's a different pattern of finds in the top as opposed to the, that bit there. There. Yeah, then the subsoil, and then on the, on the natural and in features underneath there. And how are you getting on, Phil? By and large, all the finds that we get, and they're mainly Victorian, post-medieval. The main thing is that we're recovering all the finds, not just being selective with metal. And certainly, once we get through the topsoil, which is where most of the finds are, once we get into the subsoil, we're not getting anything at all. So <laughs> what does all this tell us? It's telling us quite a lot. I mean, it's telling us that this soil has to be manure. That's where most of these modern finds are getting in, finding their way in. And then it's also telling us that below that, there's a rather different soil, which may represent pasture, and then possibly earlier fields are, are beneath that. But that earlier soil wasn't being heavily manured. A bit frustrating for you, though, all this digging empty trenches. I spend my entire life digging holes and finding nothing. I went with Ian, you know, the main digger driver here. He and I dug 1,800 metres across Salisbury Plain in four days. And what do we find? One post hole. Was I disappointed? No, of course I wasn't disappointed. The main thing is you solve the problem. We came here three days ago. We came here with a set of questions. We wanted to know about the forklift. We wanted to know about the metal objects in the plough saw. And I think over those three days, we've answered the specific targets. I know what did really hack you off, though. The local pub didn't serve real ale. <laughs> yes, you're right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, archaeologists are obviously more patient than I am. As digging comes to a halt, the mould's ready to be cracked open and the snake bracelet revealed. Beautiful, isn't it? It is. So after three days, it's finally done. It is just about. Beautiful, isn't it? Can try it on? I'd love to try it on this, please. Gosh, isn't it lovely? So elegant. 
She's beautiful. This fantastic reproduction has given us an insight into how the snake bracelet was made. But what about the rest of the wealth of Roman finds which drew us here in the first place? Our three days of careful study have given us a great chance to re-evaluate them. But what do they tell us? So, Helen, I can remember day one, table groaning with loot, wonderfully exciting, important sight, and now we're down to this. What's happened? Mm. Well, what happened was, when we got them all out of their bags for some detailed study and analysis, we discovered that there'd been quite a lot of cases of misidentification, and so we ended up really with a hard core, which represents this little group here. And, and what sort of activities do they represent, these finds? Well, I think... They represent quite a few things. Coins are uh, people losing them through holes in pockets, bags, that kind of thing. Mm. Something as beautiful as that, I think, is probably a broken brooch pin. It falls yeah. out of the clothing and you can't ever find it again. These terrets fall off a cart. It's various ways of getting into the soil. But I've seen in sites and monuments records, you know, a brooch or something equals mm. a site. Exactly, yes. And perhaps a lot more significance was given to those finds than perhaps should have been. So... Background scatter, Helen. I mean, do these finds matter, do you think? Well, in some ways it doesn't really matter, I suppose, but we could look around and think, people have been growing their food in this field for thousands of years. And I think it kind of puts us in touch with our ancestors, if that doesn't sound too silly, and in, in really quite a, quite a meaty kind of way. I don't think it's dull at all. I'm beginning to love this field, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> guys, 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 you invite the time team in, and we find absolutely nothing. Your mates are going to take the mick out of you, aren't they? <laughs> they certainly are. <laughs> How do you feel about it? Well, you said you wanted something different, Tony, and we've given it to you. Thank you very much <laughs> indeed. Pleasure. So you're going to keep on with your archaeology? We've got plenty more fields to search, plenty more fields to field walk, so, yeah. And you're going to keep on metal detecting? Certainly am. I expect you'll give us another ring soon. But certainly, find something different. <laughs> <laughs> we might not answer. <laughs> But to be fair to the guys, we have learnt something. The archaeology has proved that these fields have been farmed for 2,000 years, explaining how all the artefacts got here. This could be any field in Britain, and these finds, many of which have come up in the last few hours, could be seen to indicate the presence of a Victorian building, or a Roman villa, or a prehistoric settlement, but now, thanks to our better understanding of the results of metal detecting and field walking, we realise that this is a not untypical assemblage. It's what Francis rather poetically calls the background noise of antiquity. It's taken us over 400 metres worth of trenches to sort this little lot out. And it makes you wonder how many other sites there are out there that exist merely on the basis of a few finds and a bit of wishful thinking. Oh, and one other thing. Finally, we've done what we always threatened. After 160 programmes, we found absolutely nothing.